like to turn to Acts chapter 20 and want to begin at verse 17. Now, uh, this is the last time we'll look at the background of the book of Ephesians. Now, what you have here is, again, uh, some material about the book of Ephesians uh, in relation to the background of uh, the book and the church. Now, um, you may be seated, and it's Acts chapter 20 and verses 17 uh, through the end of the chapter. Now, uh, what uh, the context here is that um, this is probably a, a year later than his original visit to uh, Ephesus, and uh, Paul is on his uh, third missionary journey, his last missionary journey, and he has a stopover in, uh, as we read about it here in verse 17. This is Acts chapter 20 and verse 17. And from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. Now, in other words, his boat, now this is his third missionary journey, and he's on his way back actually to uh, Jerusalem. Now, um, and so now he comes to a seaport town that's about 30 miles from Ephesus. It's about 30 miles from Ephesus. And uh, he has a stopover, and he has a layover there. And now uh, he sends for the elders uh, of the church at Ephesus, and he says, I, I want to come and uh, uh, meet with you because there's some things that you need to hear that are very, very uh, important. So that's the background. You see, uh, he's 30 miles away, has a stopover uh, with traveling by boat to Jerusalem. And so he wants to gather all the elders of the church at, an, uh, at Ephesus together and the people there. And then he uh, wants to give them this message, you see, uh, because he's burdened about them. Now, all of this is the background of the book of uh, uh, Ephesians. Now, in uh, chapter 20, and in verses 18 through 21, what we have here is his review of the past. Now, uh, number one, he begins by going back to what went on previously, you see, when he was there in uh, Ephesus. Now, as you read about it in uh, verses 17 through 19, and from Miletus he sent uh, to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, he said unto them, Ye know from the first day that I came unto Asia. Now, see, he's reviewing the past. He's talking about the past. Um, and, he, and he says, uh, Ye know from the first day that I came into Asia. And that's Asia Minor, minor literally modern-day Turkey. See, the uh, town of Ephesus today is located in modern-day Turkey. Now, um, and so he says, uh, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. So he says, now, he's reviewing the time he was with them uh, and established the church in the city of Ephesus. We uh, studied about that, how they had a great revival there, how they burned the books that were worth um, uh, uh, 300 uh, pieces of uh, uh, 30,000 pieces of silver and, and uh, how there's a great revival. And then uh, the people uh, who are involved in the temple, they start up the big riot against uh, a Paul because they were losing business. They weren't selling the man-made idols the way they should. So it's very interesting, um, uh, the background that we already studied in chapter 19. But then he says um, in verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility of mind and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait uh, of the Jews. So uh, he mentions here about his exemplary uh, conduct. And then he mentions in, in verse 20 and 21 the message that he preached unto them. And he says, and now I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you, verse 20, and have taught you publicly and from house to house. Now, when he says from house to house, see, what he's referring to there are the churches 
because the churches were located in houses at that time. Now, uh, see, the word church, as we mentioned in previous studies, means to assemble together, to gather together. That's what the word uh, church means. So, and when he says from house to house, see, that's where the churches in the New Testament met. They didn't have a uh, central building to begin with. They met in the various homes. And so we read about that. Uh, he says, I taught you publicly and then uh, from house uh, to house. And then uh, in verse uh, 21, he says, testifying to the Jews and also to the Greeks. Now, um, the interesting thing here is that, see, he preached to the Jew and the Greek, uh, the Jew and the non-Jew, uh, the, the Jews and the Greeks, of course, uh, not necessarily referring to Greeks, but Gentiles, those who were not Jews. Now, in verse 20, he mentions his message. Now, and he said, this is what I preached unto you. Say, this was my message. Now, and we read here in uh, uh, verse 20, uh, and he says here, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, see, and there in the Bible, the Bible is very clear, that was the message of the Apostle Paul. See, repentance and uh, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus, uh, when he began his ministry, he said, repent and believe the gospel. Say, you have repentance and then believe uh, the gospel. Now, um, in the Great Commission in the book of Luke, uh, Luke 24, 47, and that repentance and the remission of sins should be preached in his name amongst all nations. Say, well, we preach repentance and then the forgiveness of sin. So now he talks here about repentance towards God and then faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is what salvation is all about. Say, number one is repentance and uh, the other is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, if we uh, just preach uh, believe or have faith in Jesus Christ without repentance, then we don't have uh, biblical salvation. See, there has to be repentance, that acknowledging that I am a sinner turning from my way to Jesus Christ alone as the only way of salvation. So um, we see that very clearly in the Word of God. See, repentance towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We see that over and over again in the Word of, uh, Word of God. There's no question about that, that message. So how did they get saved? And he's uh, talking about the past and he's reviewing. And he says, obviously, it was because I preach repentance. You need to repent. And obviously, see that big uh, temple of uh, Diana there, they obviously had to repent and turn from worshiping their idols. Everybody was worshiping their idols and uh, uh, all kinds of things. So they repented and they put their faith and trust in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in verses 22 and, uh, and following, uh, 22 through 27, now he shifts to the present. Now, remember what, what he's doing here. He's on his way to uh, Jerusalem. Uh, his ship stops at Miletus. He has some time, maybe a day or two, whatever, before the ship is going to set sail, uh, go back to uh, uh, the Holy Land, go back to uh, Israel. And so he calls him and he says, uh, I want you to uh, I want to gather together, you to gather together, and I want you to preach. I want to preach to you, and there's some things that uh, I want to uh, help you with. See, now number one, see, he wants it to be very, very clear about the message of salvation. Now, see, and that message that he said that I preached was the message of repentance and towards God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, um, in verses 20 through to 27, he picks up now in the present. See what he says in verse 22. 
He says, and now. So now he's talking about the present, uh, that which is going on now in his life and what he wants going on in their lives. Now, in verse 22, he says, and now, behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem. Now, what's he talking about there? Say he was on his way to Jerusalem. And he had this money that uh, he was going to give that he collected in the Gentile churches for the poor saints in Jerusalem. They were persecuted in a lot of trouble. And now uh, the once you might say, very prosperous church in Jerusalem is a poor church. And so he's taking that offering uh, to them. So he says, um, I go bound in the spirit uh, unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save, except, he says, that the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide uh, me, or are uh, going to take place uh, in, uh, in my life. Now, uh, and uh, they uh, await me. Now, that's very interesting when you think of the Apostle Paul. So it's a very interesting statement in the Word of God. Now, now Paul, we know, was an outstanding man of God. Now, there's no question about that, obviously, as we study the Word of God. See, almost half the books of the New Testament written by Paul, uh, much of the book of Acts, the second part of the book of Acts, deals basically with the Apostle Paul. But you see what he says? He says uh, that the Holy Spirit witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and affliction uh, uh, await me or abide me. Now, um, that is very, very instructive in the Word of God. See, because you say, well, if somebody's a good Christian like the Apostle Paul, if they're serving God, they want to do God's will, everything will go right in their lives. They will not have any uh, trouble. Well, the only thing as we study the Word of God, and we study now this is, he's going back home uh, uh, to Israel, and uh, he says uh, that bonds and afflictions await me there. Now, see, when we study about the Apostle Paul, and this is crystal clear in the Word of God, amen, that he is always getting in trouble as a result of preaching the gospel. See, um, again, see, back in Ephesus, they created that riot, and uh, see, uh, and then the mayor of the city, he sort of quelled the riot, but then Paul left because there was a lot of confusion. Every place he went, there was opposition and there was uh, a trouble. Now, um, that's not a very positive thing for us it's a negative thing, but that's a reality of the Christian life. See, if you live for God, not everything's going to go easy. You are going to have trials. You're going to have difficulties. And actually what he says here is uh, uh, that um, bonds, that's imprisonment, and afflictions, that's a very strong word. See, that he's going to be persecuted and uh, probably arrested. Because almost every place he went, when you study the book of Acts, you find that he had trouble, he had persecution, he had affliction. And um, we see that very clearly. But then he says in verse 24, none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself. Now that's really saying something. So he says, even though it's a lot of trouble, uh, I don't count my life dear unto myself. I'm not going to avoid these things. I'm not going to uh, take the easy way out, you see, but I'll do what God wants me uh, to do. So none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Je uh, Jesus Christ to testify, see, the gospel of the grace of God. Now, and see what Paul is saying here, I want to finish my uh, course with joy. Now, again, you have the word joy in the Bible. Most all sermons about joy are totally unscriptural and unbiblical. See, what he's talking about 
is joy in the midst of persecution, joy in the midst of trouble. Say, I can rejoice in the Lord that uh, one thing, he would be suffering as Christ suffered. That's what Jesus said. In the world, you will have tribulation. But you see, uh, we have joy in the midst of our affliction and persecution and trouble. See, it's not talking uh, about joy just to be uh, full of joy all the time. Check it out in the Bible. You see, in the early chapters of the book of Acts, the Bible says the early believers counted it joy to be persecuted for the name of Jesus Christ. Say that's joy in the midst of trouble and difficulty. And that's where the joy of the Christian comes in. Even though we face trouble, problem, difficulty, say God gives us joy in the midst of it. And we see that very clearly uh, here. So he says uh, that I might finish my course, course with uh, joy and the ministry which I've received of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, and um, we do know in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that he did, was able to say, I have finished my course. Now, what does that mean? He had finished doing what God wanted him to do with his life. See, he had the confidence that he did what God wanted him to do and his calling in life. Now, that's a great challenge to all of us as God's children. Amen. See, now uh, Paul said that that was something that burdened him during his ministry, that I wanted to do what God wanted me to do. Say, I wanted to be faithful to God. Now, at the end of his ministry, 2 Timothy chapter 4, he mentions that he had finished his course. He had done what God wanted him to do. And then he says to, uh, to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Now, again, he refers to the gospel here as the gospel of the grace of God. Why? Because, say, uh, people are saved by grace. There's nothing that a person can do to earn their salvation. Salvation is all of the grace of God. Say, God gives us a gift that we don't deserve. That's salvation. Say, the word uh, grace and, and gift, it's a very similar uh, word. And that's what salvation is. Say, accepting the gift that God gives us. It certainly has nothing to do with uh uh, keeping the Old Testament law or anything uh, along that line. And then he says now in verse 25, he says here, And now, behold, I know that ye all among you whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God shall see my face no more. Now, now you see, he's at the seaport town. He has a layover. He's 30 miles from Ephesus. He calls the believers to come up. Uh, and because he wants to preach to him, and he says, you'll probably never see me again. This is probably the last time uh, you will ever uh, uh, see me, so that's why uh, I want you to uh, take heed. These things that I'm telling you are very, very uh, important. Now, he says here, uh, go on preaching the kingdom of God and shall see my face uh, no more. Now, there, I think, is a great verse about the kingdom of God. Again, where a lot of people are way off in their teaching uh, about the kingdom of God. And a lot of times people, like here, a lot of commentators, they say, well, he was teaching them about Bible prophecy. No, he was not teaching them about Bible prophecy. He was teaching them how you enter the kingdom of God. Of God. Remember John chapter 3? What did Jesus tell Nicodemus? Say, you cannot enter God's kingdom, say, unless you are born again. Say, has nothing to do with prophecy. He's not, he didn't hold a prophetic conference there, but he did tell him how to enter into the kingdom of God, and that was through repentance and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's very interesting. See, a lot of people, every time they uh, see certain words in the Bible, they jump off and talk about Bible prophecy. No, he, 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 uh, that was not the thing he was interested uh, in uh, teaching them about. But he was interested, and what he did do 
when he was at Ephesus, is tell him how you do get into the kingdom of God, just like Nicodemus and Jesus. Now, but he says, you shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men. Now, boy, that is really something. Amen. I mean, how could the Apostle Paul, now we know why he could say that. Now, you see, that he's pure from the blood of all men. That, that he knows that when he was there, he did what God wanted him to do. He did not hold back on anything, and no one could accuse him of um, not preaching what God wanted him to preach. You see, that's a tremendous statement in, uh, in the Word of God. As he says, I'm pure from the blood of all men. I'm pure from the blood. In other words, I have a good conscience. See, I know that nobody there that I ministered to uh, there in Ephesus, when I preached and ministered in Ephesus, could come up to me and say, you never told me about the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you never told me how uh, to avoid hell. You see, uh, he's pure from the blood of, uh, of all men. He gave them exactly what God wanted them uh, to hear. And that's the way we ought to be live. Are we pure from the blood of all men. Could people accuse you and accuse me and saying that um, I knew you, you were my friend, but you never told me about salvation. You never uh, talked to me about that. Say, you never encouraged me uh, to even come to church. Say, now if we're like that with people, Say, their blood will be upon our hands, and we'll have to give an account of it at the judgment seat of Christ. See, we read about that in the book of Ezekiel. Say, that, uh, that, that it, we're not responsible, Ezekiel said, there in the book of Ezekiel, to convert anybody. But we are responsible to warn them of the judgment to come. And in the book of Ezekiel, it says, if we do not warn them, then their blood will be required at our hands. What's that mean? We'll have to give an account. And that'll be a sad account that we'll have to give at the judgment seat of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul could say that. Now, that's why when we think about witnessing in the Bible, the Bible is very, very clear. Say, every saved person ought to be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. Say, everybody ought to witness to everybody in their world. Now, that means that whenever we get an opportunity uh, to talk to someone, now obviously we're not to steal time from the employer uh, and uh, uh, so forth. And if someone's at the uh, cashier at the, uh, the shop right or the grocery store, uh, we can't stop the law at lying and, and uh, tell them I want to uh, talk to you about uh, salvation, but you maybe could give them a track and uh, be, uh, and, and so forth with that. But the people in our lives, the people that we are one-on-one -on -one with, the people that we have an opportunity to talk to, it is our responsibility to be a witness unto them. So on Sunday morning, we'll be dealing with the matter, say, that every child of God is to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Say, and... Uh, we actually, in this life, are taking the place of Jesus Christ in telling people the gospel message. Now, uh, that's clear in the Word of God. See, we, we need to be, um, as he says here, pure, uh, innocent from the blood of all men. Now, how many Christians are, would be guilty uh, in relation to never witnessing to people that they had the opportunity to witness to. Now, again, I'm not talking about the cashier at uh, ShopRite. Oh, well, you can give them a track. But uh, people that you come in contact with. See, that's a divine appointment that you have to talk to them about the Lord. Now, uh, and that should be the normal result of the Christian life. Nowhere in the Bible does the Bible 
uh, teach anybody how to witness. It's never taught in the Bible. See, the uh, four spiritual laws uh, or the Romans wrote are not taught in the Bible. What is taught that everybody who is a Christian should have a natural and normal desire to witness to others. That should be the natural desire of every child of God to be a witness to others. That, that's uh, the result of being a, a Christian. So much could be said about that. I, I knew a man, he's not a member of the church here, but he was involved in a scouting program. And he had all these uh, fellas and, and uh, he was a leader and uh, they all uh, looked up to him and, and uh, revered this man and uh, thought he was the greatest person in all the world. And he was a tremendous guy. He had a tremendous personality. Uh, if you'd meet him, uh, you'd just shake his hand, you'd fall in love with him. And uh, he was that type of an individual. But uh, he was a Christian and he was saved and he was very active in his local church. But he never once witnessed to any of those guys. And when they grew up, became men, they would come over his house. They uh, would spend uh, time in his house uh, talking to him and, uh, and so forth when these men uh, grew up and so forth. And he, he just like he, he really knew all of the young people, very active in his church. But he never once witnessed any of those guys. Never once. See, I knew the man. He never once invited him out to church. Can you figure that out? See, uh, but see, see, there's a lot or some Christians like that. See, they're ashamed of the gospel. See, and um, they will be responsible for those people that he witnessed to, that he did not witness to. And uh, there are Christians like that. See, that might be saved or in the church, but uh, in their life, they never witnessed anybody in their life. Uh, people they come in contact with, keep people they know, family members, others that they've never uh, witnessed to. So it's very interesting what Paul says here. I am pure from the blood of all men. Verse 27 he says here, for I have not shown to declare unto you all the counsel of God. Now you see what he's saying. I know what I preached. I did not shun the whole counsel of God. I believe that I preached everything to you that I, that God wanted me to preach unto you. See, I didn't trim the message. Now, again, uh, when the people got saved, remember, they burned all the books, you see, and uh, all those occult books, that type of thing. And then uh, when people got saved, remember when we studied about the temple of uh, Diana and what, what happened? See, they, uh, uh, the, the men that were making all these, this money selling all these idols and trinkets in relation to the uh, temple of Diana, which had then literally literally was one of the seven wonders of the world. People come from all over the world. And so they said that we're losing money. And we're losing money because this guy came to our town by the name of Paul and he preached the gospel. And so say, when they got saved, they, they threw away their idols and they stopped buying the idols and uh, that type of a thing. Now you see, Paul could say, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's not only Paul, but that should challenge all of us. Um, can we say that to our friends, neighbors, those that we come in contact with, um, that we have the opportunity uh, to witness to? I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. I read an article the other day, and a fellow was talking about um, Christianity in America. And he said, see, uh, Christianity in America is... Uh, uh, is entertainment. He said churches are entertainment centers. He said they are uh, gimmicks and so forth. And um, what he was pointing out was that, see, 
uh, uh, many people, if not most people, even in Bible-believing churches in America today, are there because of a gimmick or some promotion or uh, uh, some entertainment, and they're not saved. That our churches, he said, are filled with people who are not saved. They're there, but they're there for all these different uh, reasons. Now, um, I think that's true. And in a lot of messages, and you check out a lot of messages, see, they're simply what people want to hear. See, uh, that's what they preach, and they have all these things, you know, they have computers, and they get all these materials. In fact, many times they get their sermons, and, uh, and see, it's all designed to be very unoffensive and to tell everybody what they want to hear. And they, they know what, uh, say, the people in their ear, uh, area want to hear, and so that's what they preach. See, they're not preaching the Word of God. They use the Bible and they sprinkle it with verses, but they're preaching what people want to hear. Now, he said, uh, I have not shunned to declare unto you, say, all the counsel of God. See, the, the message of God, the message that's found in um, the Word of God. Now, in verses 28 through 30, Eight, through the rest of the chapter, you have the future. And what he's talking about here is, see, this was the main reason why he wanted to speak to these people during his stopover, uh, his ship stopover for a few days in Miletus. Now, in verse 28, he says, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Now, now, he's talking here about people who would be leading the church. These, they were just saved, his new church, church in every one of their homes, or they met it in the homes. And uh, here's a great challenge in the Word of God. Say, take heed, therefore, unto yourselves. Now, say, what is Paul saying there? Before you try to help anybody else, Make sure you are right with God. Make sure your spiritual life is what it ought to be. Now, see, very important as we study the Word of God. See, he, he doesn't tell them to do something, you see. Now, he will tell them certain things to do and uh, uh, so forth, and their responsibilities as a Christian. But before he gets into anything like that, he says, Take heed unto yourselves. Don't try to help somebody else unless you make sure your heart is right with God. Make sure you're in fellowship with God. Make sure uh, you've confessed your sins and repented of your sins and make sure uh, you are a healthy Christian before you try to help anybody else. See, it says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. That's number one. Just like in uh, Acts chapter 6, it says, Now the leaders of the church at Jerusalem were to give themselves, first of all, to prayer, and number two, to the Word of God. Say Acts 6 and verse 4. Say we will give ourselves continually to prayer and then the ministry of the Word. Say we always uh, take heed unto ourselves. Say that's why we want to pray every day. Start every day with prayer. We ought to start every day with uh, reading something in, in the Bible to help us get on the right uh, road, so to speak. Now, but he says here in verse 28, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and then to all the flock. Now you see the sequence there. Make sure your heart is right with God. And then, if your heart is right with God, you have a, a job to do in the local church. And he says, and to all the flock. Now, that's the way the church is referred to, say, as a flock. Now, they were in house churches, and somebody has brought out very interestingly that that word flock here means little flock. Say, a little flock. And, um, but, but he says here, um, to all the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you over 
seers. Now, in other words, Paul pointed out some men, they were spiritual men. He left with his evangelistic um, team, and he left certain men in charge that he was there for three years, he says. And so he left them in, in charge, see, and they were like the overseers. Now, by the way, See, again, we were studying the word church and how the word church means assembly, and that's how it's translated three times in Acts chapter 19. But here you have the word overseer. See, now that's the word that's translated in 1 Timothy 3 as bishop. See, it's not referring to a bishop. The word doesn't mean bishop. It means an overseer. Now, you see, when you check these things out in the word of God, like here, that's a correct translation. It's an overseer. He didn't say you're a bishop, you see, but that is, again, religion and when people use interpretation rather than exposition of the Bible. So you have the word overseers and then to feed the church of God. Uh, now, that word feed is the New Testament word. Well, let, let me ask the question. What do you think that's the New Testament word for? Feed the flock. What is that word? Uh, what is that word? What does it mean? See, that's a New Testament word for pastor. That is the word for pastor. See, he's a shepherd. He feeds the flock. That's the word there. See, pastor. See, um, and, he, and he says here, uh, feed the church of God. See, now, see, you have the overseers. See, they oversee the church. But then, see, they're the overseers. Again, not bishops, it's, uh, that's not the word. It's simply they're to oversee uh, the work. But then they're to feed the church of God. Say, and that's the word pastor. Say the word pastor, shepherd. Say feed the flock. Say that is the word for uh, a pastor. And so it says here, you see, uh, the feed the church of God with he per which he hath purchased with his own Blood. Now, you see, he's preaching here, and uh, it's the last time he's going to see him. And he says, see, the church of God, and by the way, see, there's a lot of theology here. A lot, a lot of theology. See, it's, now these were meeting in the homes throughout uh, the city of Ephesus. And Paul did not say, it's my church. He didn't say it's your church. This assembly, this church that he established, these churches, again, meeting in homes at that time. Uh, you see, uh, he said it's the church of God. Now, that word of uh, speaks of uh, not only origin, but possession. See, the church is God's church. Has nothing to do with the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, the Lions Club, the Elks Club, and all the animal clubs and all that type of a thing. See, it has nothing to do with uh, that. You see, uh, the church is God's institution. It's the church of God. God originated it. Uh, Jesus is the Lord of the church. See, it's not man's church. It's God's Church, that's a tremendous truth. See, there's a lot of theology wherever you study the Bible. Now, and then he goes on and he says, which he has purchased with his own blood. And that's very, very clear. You see, that um, the church came into existence, was purchased, the origin of the church goes back to the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That was uh, his blood that was shed. You see, and uh, without the shedding of blood is no remission, as we preached recently uh, uh, about that. See, the basis of all forgiveness is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross of Calvary. It has nothing to do with our works. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, our goodness, see, but he purchased the church with his own blood. It's very interesting as you study uh, verse uh, 28, because um, he says here, the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Now, 
it seems when you study this verse out, what is this saying about the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross? You see, um, in verse 28, see, it's a church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. And I believe that's a reference to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, we can truly say, see, we can truly say that the blood that Jesus Christ shed on the cross of Calvary was God's blood because he was God. He was God in human flesh. But you see what it says here, say, which he, God, hath purchased with his own blood. I believe that's a great reference to the fact that Jesus is God, and that blood that was shed was the blood of God on the cross of Calvary. See, that's the basis of our salvation. There's no salvation apart from the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, now again, in America, there are a lot of churches that will preach about the cross of Christ and Jesus dying, but there's a lot of churches that will never, ever mention his blood. See, they say that's a, uh, that's a bad word. That's, uh, that's not a, uh, a word that civilized people should use. And so uh, a lot of lay people don't pick it up, but see, they'll never talk about the blood of Christ. See, and yet, see, the Bible talks about the blood of Christ over and over again. Refers, remember, Peter refers to the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Now, you see, he purchased it with his own blood. See, that's how the church came into existence, is through the blood of Christ. And if someone has not applied that blood to their life, you see, uh, uh, they have no right to be a member or be in the local church because see it's purchased with his blood like the Passover see they had to apply the blood to the lentils and the doorpost and if the blood wasn't applied the death angel would come and um, the judgment of God upon the firstborn of that family would die that's the Passover see the blood had to be applied someone can know about the blood but we need to apply the blood personally to our Live. So, um, see, there's a lot of great teaching here. Now, the main thrust of what Paul is teaching here in the Word of God uh, is found in the next few verses. He says, For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. See? False doctrine will be prominent in churches. See, and that's why the job of a pastor is to take a stand and to protect a church against false teaching. Now, um, as well as to preach the gospel. Now, um, but then he says in verse 30, also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Now, now this is, again, a very powerful teaching. Now, all this is the background of the book of Ephesus, uh, Ephesians. We didn't get into the book of Ephesians because it's a, it's a great study to just study the background, like we're doing here, of the book of uh, uh, Ephesians. And then uh, he says, of your own selves. Say, people who say they're saved, people that are in the church, uh, people that are respected, false doctrine will come from them. And he says, from within your own group. Now, uh, right there within your own uh, local church, you see, he says, of your own selves shall men Men arise. As we mentioned Sunday morning, Jesus had 12 apostles and one was a traitor. 
Judas was not saved. Judas never did get saved. Judas was a thief. But outwardly, he had the best testimony of all the apostles. No apostle had a better testimony than Judas. Nobody ever dreamed that Judas would betray the Lord. When, uh, when Judas spoke up in John chapter 12, all the other apostles agreed with him. They said, oh yes, Mary should have never given that expensive offering on Jesus Christ. And you'd read all the Gospels, they all agreed with Judas. Now, you see what the Bible says, of your own selves. He's not saying from the outside. He's not talking here about Jehovah Witnesses or Mormons. You see, he's talking here about people within the church will arise with false doctrine, leading people astray. Now, you see, the seven churches of Revelation, Revelation 2 and 3, they're all located uh, near to uh, Ephesus in modern-day Turkey, Asia Minor, or Asia in the Bible. Now, what do you learn when you study uh, Revelation 2 through and 3? See, now that was written some years later, and the indication in almost every local church of those seven churches, false doctrine in one way or another invaded every church from within the church. It's very interesting as we study the Bible, amen? See, that's why the job of a pastor is not only preach the gospel, but protect the church, see, from error and false doctrine. As I mentioned Sunday morning, is there a Judas in the Garden State Baptist Church? We'd say, oh no, well, Jesus had one, amen? Uh, one of the twelve. Now, and he's talking here about people from within are going to try to spread false doctrine, not from without, but from uh, within. Well, uh, this is interesting, and um, we'll have to pick that up next Wednesday evening. So your homework is to study uh, on in verses 29 through the end of the chapter, uh, chapter 20, because these are very powerful words and teaching in the Word of God, and I trust that God will edify us through it. Now, now you see, Paul had a burden. You see, and uh, he said, you all come up here 30 miles away. My boat is docked here for a few days. Now, now uh, he said, and one of the things I want to warn you about, uh, you see, is false teaching in the church. And what Paul is saying to these new Christians, say, remember, there is in all probability people within your local assembly that want to spread false teaching and lead people astray after themselves rather than, as he says here, uh, disciples after themselves rather than uh, following the Lord Jesus Christ. So we'll pick it up in verse 29 next Wednesday night, and that's your homework to study on uh, those verses in the Word of God. Now, does anybody have a question, a comment, or an observation in relation to any of these verses that we read this evening? You see, now, Paul is not dealing here with theology and Bible doctrine, but he sure does bring out a lot of theology and Bible doctrine, amen? Amen. Say, by the way, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And what's the first thing the, um, the miracle Bible does? It's inspired of God. It's a miracle of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And what's the first thing the Bible is, uh, does? It's all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for Doctrine, teaching, doctrine. See, that's the first thing God wants us to get in the Bible. What is the doctrine of the Bible? See, what does the Bible really teach? You see, the doctrine, uh, that's why we have uh, the Word of God. So the Lord willing, we'll go into that. Somebody had a, a question uh, or a comment on these verses. Again, um, wherever you study the Bible, it's a blessing, amen? And it's very enlightening and very helpful. And it builds us up and it edifies us as a child of God. That's why we need to study the Bible and the whole counsel of, of God. 
Somebody had a question? Yeah. Amen. That's a, that's a good observation. We have the Holy Spirit. We have God, the Father, and we have the, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Anybody else have a, a comment or a, a thought here? This is, this is a great passage in the Word of God. See, a great, great passage to help us as God's children and to challenge us as uh, God's children. Amen.